Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Friday, May 6, 2016, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Here's what's coming up tonight. Tonight, with the current evidence, a legal expert says it would be nearly impossible not to charge Hillary. After that, a study shows the third leading cause of death in the U.S. has nothing to do with alcohol, tobacco, or firearms. And does Bernie have the tools to clinch the Democratic nomination? That's next. Well, a new medical study released Tuesday shows that medical errors are now the third leading cause of death in the United States. So this is a new Johns Hopkins study, and it was published in the BMJ on Tuesday. And it shows that medical errors uh, claim 251,000 lives every year. That's more than respiratory disease, accidents, stroke, and Alzheimer's. Now, the professor that led this study said that the category includes everything from bad doctors to communication breakdowns when patients are handed off from one department to another. And he goes on to say that this calculation of 251,000 deaths per year equates to nearly 700 deaths a day. But John Rappaport goes on in this article to point out how the Centers for Disease Control uh, doesn't even require reporting of medical errors in the data that it collects about deaths through billing codes. So that makes it harder to see what's really going on at the national level. And something else that's also overlooked is the number of severe patient injuries resulting from medical error. Some estimates put this number at 40 times the death rate. So if you take that figure, 40 times the death rate would give us every year in the U.S. there are 10 million severe injuries as a result of medical errors. And then, of course, the CDC is completely in the dark on the third leading cause of death. And this, of course, is the agency that keeps continually telling all of us that vaccines are completely safe and effective. Don't worry about any medical errors or any severe injuries that might result from that. And this is, of course, you know, the argument you're going to hear from many people that want to uh, talk back at you if you are curious about what you might be causing autism and perhaps the link there with the vaccines. Just let them know that the experts represent a system that kills three million Americans per decade and severely injures 100 million Americans. So, you know, for more on those explosive figures, make sure to go to the breakdown of that article at Infowars.com. Now, Dr. Tony Bark was on the Alex Jones show today. That's Billy Corgan's doctor, actually. And he said, you've got to get her on. And she was on the show talking about the benefits of medicinal uh, cannabis, but as also the CDC's autism cover up. And she goes in depth into the effects of vaccine injury as well as how to reverse them. So that's going to be coming up in one of the next segments. Stick around for that. But now Judicial Watch's FOIA lawsuit has uncovered even more Hillary Clinton emails that she withheld from the State Department. So this completely contradicts some statements that Hillary Clinton made that as far as she knew, all of her government emails were turned over to the State Department and that she did not use her ClintonEmail.com system until March 18th, 2009. So these uh, documents predate that and they go back as far as January. They weren't turned over by Clinton to the State Department from her non-government server. The emails cover topics such as her schedule and travel plans, criticisms of Clinton by Richard Gere, Afghanistan, U.S. financial aid and security concerns for several Pacific islands, the recommendation for a health care system overhaul and food security. Now, despite suggestions that Clinton said she turned over all emails dated March 18th, 2009, here were some other emails that she failed to turn over. It includes uh, some talk about her friends at Planned Parenthood, a call to Bill Clinton's former national security advisor, and of course the late Sandy Berger, who was convicted of illegally removing classified documents from the National Archives. Hmm, no problems there. So of course these emails further undermine uh, her statement under penalty of perjury that suggested she turned over all of her government emails to the State Department. This is according to Judicial Watch's President Tom Fitton. So how many more emails is the Obama administration hiding? And of course, something else we all know, uh, the hacker Guccifer, who was the first one to actually expose Hillary Clinton's use of a private email. Um, he was extradited to the United States in March. He posted emails that were sent from the then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton 
uh, correspondence to the close Clinton family confidant, Sidney Blumenthal. Well, he was extradited to the U.S. Um, just as reports were coming in that the FBI was investigating Clinton's email server. So here's an interesting question to pose. NBC, they were now the second major news network to announce an upcoming interview with the hacker. But curiously, they held on to some explosive revelations for weeks. Seems like they were forced to say, hey, we've got a, a major uh, interview coming up with him as well, because uh, Fox News were, said that they were going to put out their interview. So then MS, uh, NBC says, you know what, we've got one in the can as well coming out. But why did they hold on to this? for weeks. Here's a little bit of the uh, transcript with Cynthia McFadden. She says, when Hillary Clinton says that her server is absolutely safe, you're laughing. And uh, Lucifer goes on to say, that's a lie. It's not safe. It's not safe at all. So he's basically saying that, you know, I hacked into her email server. She says it's not safe and that's totally a lie. And then, of course, the Clinton camp fired back saying there's absolutely no basis to believe the claims made by this criminal from his prison cell. Oh, he's such a bad person because he actually has been put in prison. Meanwhile, you continually evade being put in prison. So there's no reason for anyone to believe the claims that you're making as well. And Judge Andrew Napolitano says that there's a tremendous deal in the works and an incentive for Guccifer to negotiate with the FBI and become a witness for the government against Mrs. Clinton. And he goes on to say that proof of hacking would make it nearly impossible not to charge Hillary. So this, of course, is the answer to that question of why did NBC, the Clinton media cover up, why they hold on to that explosive interview. And here's why, because they don't want to ruin Clinton's chances of becoming the Democratic nominee and, of course, the president. And a lot of people are saying, you know what, hold up, because it's not going to be just the Republican convention that's going to be contested, but Bernie Sanders might be well equipped to upend the Democratic convention as well. And, you know, he's probably not going to win the delegates that he needs to beat Clinton, but he's definitely going to have a sizable presence at the convention, which means that he could shape the Democratic Party's rules and their platform to include some of his top priorities. But Clinton, you know, she said, it's fine. We're going to talk about his priorities because they have the same goals. Hmm. Of course, and someone else who also shares the same goals and agenda as Hillary Clinton, surprisingly, is House Speaker Paul Ryan, who has come out and said that he won't be backing Trump over Hillary. Uh, he wants someone that's going to unite the parties. Well, it's no surprise because he has functionally the same positions as Hillary Clinton. He supports more foreign migration, more foreign trade, and more foreign military engagements. Now, Trump's spokesperson came out and said that he really shouldn't even be the representative there then if he can't get behind the party's nominee. And of course, as I've been away on vacation, a lot of stuff has happened. Ted Cruz and Kasich dropped out. Donald Trump, of course, uh, named a former Goldman partner and uh, Soros money manager as his finance chairman. So that, of course, raised some red flags. And so after that fumble, he has now hired a pro-life advocate as his top domestic policy director. Uh, this is John Mashburn. And so this might serve those people who say that Donald Trump isn't conservative enough. And we had Washington insider Roger Stone on The Alex Jones Show today. He was breaking down uh, some new insights in what the Trump campaign's next move might be, including who could be the VP. What about VP? So many folks are saying, get the governor, the former governor of Oklahoma, who's a woman. I'm not for gimmicks, but she's a great lady. Wouldn't that be a good coup against Hillary's, uh, you know, female uh, vote claim? Well, uh, you know, once one thing that President Richard Nixon once told me was, when looking for a running mate, don't try to find somebody who can help you. You'd be lucky to find somebody who doesn't hurt you. That is, of course, ironic in view of the fact that both of the running mates that he chose, Spiro Agnew and Henry Cabot Lodge, turned out to be disasters that hurt him in the 68 and the 1960 campaigns. I think you can get too clever here. The good news is that, that Donald Trump, without the prospect of a contested convention, has much, much broader latitude in who he chooses. He doesn't have to go check the boxes, uh, pick a woman, pick a Hispanic, pick a career politician. 
Uh, and therefore, I got the impression, and he holds this very close to his vest, uh, that he is going to look at a broad cross-section of people that perhaps we haven't considered yet. Now, you do have to be uh, cognizant uh, of the need for vetting. Uh, the only advantage of taking somebody who has run for president in the most recent cycle, a John Kasich, a, a Marco Rubio, is that they're fully vetted. I really don't get the impression that that is where he's headed. So when you I, say, because boy, I'm salivating here for the exclusiveness of this, when you say he's looking into a section no one ever looked into, is that military? Is that industry? I mean, please tell us what that section is. Well, I think it could be military because when he said, I want somebody from the political system, I think what he actually meant was I need somebody who knows how the government runs. That didn't necessarily mean an elected politician. Uh, so it could be for somebody from the military. I think that, that Trump is very, very shrewd. He understands that two business people on a ticket with, uh, with no government experience is probably not the best uh, prescription for government. And he wants somebody sure. who can navigate the walls of government to implement his program over the objections. Sure. Of Isn't Chris Christie geographically too close, though? I, I, don't, I think Chris Christie is, uh, would be the wrong choice for a couple of reasons. First of all, the George Washington Bridge scandal is probably not over. The people charged in that scandal are going to go to trial shortly. There's also a very significant civil trial. Uh, and it remains to be seen until those two trials are over what Chris Christie's vulnerabilities may or may not be. Geographically, it doesn't make sense. Uh, I, I think uh, it, it would send the wrong signal. I think Trump is thinking much broader than that. Uh, now, we could all be surprised. Only he is going to make this choice. He's not a man who tips his hand in advance. But I, I think he's looking at a broad cross-section of people, not necessarily elected politicians. Heiko Maas, the German Federal Minister of Justice, got an earful of the voice of the German people while speaking at a May Day celebration. The German people chant, you leftist rat and traitor. Maas says, no, we're here to stay. We aren't going anywhere. The chants of traitor and get out become stronger and louder. But Moss fires back, threatening, we will also take care of the interests of those people shouting traitor right now without even knowing what's happening to them. The chants continue as Moss says, shout all you want, the longer you shout, the longer I shall stand here. Finally, he leaves the podium as they chant, traitor, get out. <laughs> Leaving the Germans to chant, we are the people. Heiko Maas, yet another arrogant globalist tool from the Merkel regime, the same man that introduced a 2015 law known as Data Stolen Goods, a law described by Berlin District Court Judge Ulf Burrymeyer as an anti-whistleblower law intended to deal a mighty blow to democracy and freedom of speech, where in Germany, Xenophobia and racism is now a punishable crime. Furthermore, Moss is now calling for a legal ban on sexist advertisements. Germany, well known for its liberal attitude towards adult entertainment, is now being forced to scale back its culture in order to appease the wishes of the growing Muslim refugee population exploding within Germany. Meanwhile, the German people are being held captive by the ungrateful foreign invaders and their own treasonous government. <laughs> William F. Jasper of the New American writes, The migration tsunami that swamped Europe with 1.5 million refugees in 2015 is roaring back with a tidal wave that may be double the size of last year's deluge. In fact, most citizens of the European Union countries appear to be unaware that their unelected and unaccountable rulers at the European Commission 
in their own European Economic Forecast report issued last fall announced precisely that. That is, they projected with apparent acceptance and approval that 3 million refugee migrants would arrive in Europe in 2016. Time is running out. The globalists have all but achieved their soft invasion of Europe, and that planned gridlock of civilization is heading in your general direction. As I speak, thousands of unvetted refugees are filing into small towns across the United States via what will be known later as a broken vetting process. A process that should have taken two years has now been reduced to a few pointless months. It's Obama's turn, and he aims to match Merkel's numbers. How do you think the president would explain to uh, um, Mr. Merkel about his inability to have that happen here in the United States when Germany's taken in close to, I think, maybe a million people? Well, again, I, I, um, I think the president, when he travels to Germany, uh, will be prepared to tell her that he's prepared to meet the goal. Um, that so. seems like it might be a little embarrassing to not be able to get admit 10,000 10, people into your country. But, Ron, I'm not willing to say that we're not going to hit the goal. John Bound for Infowars.com. Well, a lot of people have been really concerned about the amount of earthquakes that have been happening all over the world, as well as volcanic eruptions. Well, beginning on March 14, 2016, there have been a, a number of small magnitude earthquakes occurring beneath Mount St. Helens here in the U.S. Uh, over the last eight weeks, there have been over 130 earthquakes They've, that was formerly located by the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network, and many other earthquakes were too small to be located. And now they are saying that this is uh, probably likely because the magma chamber is slowly recharging, and as the stress drives fluid through cracks, it produces these small quakes. And so far they say, you know, there's nothing to worry about because this current pattern of seismic activity is similar to the swarms that were seen uh, at Mount St. Helens in 2013 and 2014. But over the past couple of months, major earthquakes have shaken areas all over the planet and major volcanoes have also been erupting uh, with a frequency that's a little bit more than startling. Well, of course, we've seen in Oklahoma, they've absolutely shattered their record for quakes last year. And we also saw a really disturbing earthquake take place right there along the New Madrid Fault. And one scientist is now saying that the San Andreas Fault in Southern California it looks like it's locked, loaded, and ready to go. This is Thomas Jordan. He's the director of the Southern California Earthquake Center. And this is out of an LA Times article. He says the springs on the San Andreas system have been wound very, very tight. And the southern San Andreas Fault in particular looks like it's locked, loaded, and ready to go. And of course, that San Andreas Fault is way overdue for a big quake. So we're talking about a truly historic event here. And according to the Daily Mail, uh, they're also saying that it's not just California we need to be concerned about, but that giant chunks of the Earth's mantle are breaking off and sinking into the planet under the North American plate. And this, of course, could explain why we've been seeing this record number of earthquakes in the eastern part of the country in recent, in recent years. So, of course, that's rather ominous warning there. Uh, but if you're really interested in this, check out David Knight's in-depth report that he did. It's on the Alex Jones channel. It's titled, Experts Reveal Yellowstone Supervolcano Unpredictable. On Saturday, September 27th, 2014, at noon, local time in Japan, Mount Antake suddenly exploded without warning. Many hikers and tourists were on the mountain at the time. One person tweeted a picture of the top of the volcano moments before it erupted. Over 30 people are now feared dead. Japan is a very active area for earthquakes and volcanoes. It's closely monitored, continuously monitored, yet it underscores that scientists still don't understand volcanoes well enough to predict them accurately. Mount Antake shows that we won't always get months of warning like we did with Mount St. Helens before a volcano explodes. And if recent research papers are correct, supervolcanoes like Yellowstone could explode suddenly, without warning, without seismic movement signaled as earthquakes. When we think of an explosive volcanic eruption, we imagine it being preceded by earthquakes, by ground swelling, by the mountain venting some hot gas, perhaps even some lava. These are the signs we look for in the inexact science of volcanic predictions. But two research papers published on the very same day this year say that predicting supervolcano eruptions is even more difficult than predicting the eruptions of regular volcanoes. More on that in a moment. But first, do the events in Yellowstone earlier this year 
demonstrate changes that may be building toward an eruption? We did have an earthquake of 4.8 magnitude. Now that is the largest we've had in Yellowstone in over 30 years. And a couple of months later, shuts down a road that's melted because of increased ground temperature. People start to get edgy about an impending eruption. I went to Yellowstone recently, and geothermal activity is everywhere. A reminder that you're on top of a super caldera and magma dome, the largest on Earth. Frankly, we are just a, a few miles above some really hot magma. That magma serves as the heat that fuels the geysers and hot springs and fumaroles in the park. It's that engine that allows for the unique things that we see here in Yellowstone. This is what the melted road looks like two months later. Yellowstone spokesman at the time said the road had turned to soup, and that was widely reported, even in the mainstream media. But when I spoke to a ranger there, she dismissed it as simply a bad asphalt job. That was closed due to uh, melting the heat? Uh, no, melt. no, it has nothing to do with that. That was just a couple of days. It was the asphalt was soft. Mm -hmm. It was actually a, a bad asphalt job that they had done the summer previous to that. Okay. And that combined with the intensity of the sun in the middle of the summer um, and that it was in a hydrothermal area, that it just got soft. Oh, okay. And they All just right. had to replace it. So it had nothing to do with an increase in geothermal activity in that area, no. the ground being hotter. It was just no. the asphalt, was it? The, the asphalt, yeah, it was the combination of those things in that particular spot. I hadn't visited Firehole Lake Drive when I spoke to her, or I would have challenged what she told me. Two months later, the road still doesn't look good. But more importantly, Yellowstone spokesman told the press at the time that people needed to stay away from the road because there was a high danger of stepping on seemingly solid soil into severely hot water. Contrary to what she said, Firehole Lake is an active geothermal area, and you can see that the road deteriorates as it comes into proximity to geothermal features. But it's what we've come to expect from government employees at every level, fear for their job if controversy erupts, and contempt for the public's right to know. If it was just a bad asphalt job, heated up by the sun, rather than increased ground temperature, then why are there other melted paved areas that they've just fenced off rather than try to fix? My suspicion is that the spots are so hot at the moment that they can't fix them. Ground temperature goes up and down with seismic activity in the park. We see between 1,000 and 3,000 earthquakes a year in Yellowstone. Most of them are so small, nobody ever feels them. Swarms of small earthquakes that you can't even feel can cause the ground to go through major changes. Look at this area that was once a forest. The ground was a hospitable environment for trees to grow for a long period of time. Then in 1978, swarms of small earthquakes caused the ground in this area to rise to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. It wasn't the quakes, but the heat that killed the trees. So while we may be heading into another period of increased activity in Yellowstone, it's far from the largest activity we've seen since it became a park. Of course, everyone will tell you that it's not if, but when, the super caldera blows up. The difficulty, of course, is knowing when that's going to happen. Two research papers that were released on the same day this year, January the 5th, 2014, say that supervolcanoes aren't just bigger volcanoes. They have a completely different mechanism. The firing mechanism is a function of the buoyancy of the gigantic magma dome and the size of the dome. It makes it much more unpredictable than a regular volcano. And about the same time these research papers were saying that the eruption of a supervolcano was a function of magma dome size, we learned that Yellowstone's magma dome is two and a half times larger than they previously thought. 55 miles long, 18 miles wide, three to nine miles deep. For the sake of comparison, let's pretend for a moment that global warming predictions used to justify global taxation of man-made global warming are true. The IPCC's worst case scenarios range from a 1 to 3 degree centigrade increase to a 2 to 6 degree centigrade increase, and that's over a 100 year period. But if the Yellowstone supervolcano erupted, scientists say it could drop temperatures 10 degrees centigrade, that's about 18 degrees Fahrenheit, globally, and 12 degrees or 22 degrees Fahrenheit in the northern hemisphere for six to 10 years. In other words, that's two to 10 times the change in temperature of the most alarmist scenario that Al Gore can imagine. And it would happen immediately, not stretched out over 100 years, and it would last for a decade. That would be real climate change. And of course, that would just be the temperature effect of a supervolcano eruption. There's also the devastation of the ash covering the ground and the massive explosion estimated to be 1,000 times the size of the Hiroshima nuclear bomb 
every second. The science of, uh, of volcanic predictions is very new mm -hmm. um, and unreliable at best. I think most of the ones that they think they'd be able to predict they're thinking like maybe hours to days yeah. that they'd be able to give people. This one, we, we think we know what, it, what we'd be looking for, and most of those are for little Mount St. Helens style eruptions, mm -hmm. which, is, which is little compared to this. Yeah. Yes, the deadliest, most destructive volcanic eruption in U.S. history, where 57 people died, is a very tiny eruption compared to what could happen even with a partial eruption at Yellowstone. Mount St. Helens began in March 15, 1980, with a lot of earthquakes, over 100 in six days. Then a 4.2 magnitude earthquake, a little smaller than the 4.8 Yellowstone quake in April. Five days later, seven earthquakes, all over magnitude 4.0 in just one day. The next day, the first eruption with a plume of 7,000 feet. The volcano continued to erupt over several weeks, and the plume rose to 20,000 feet. By April 17th, about a month after the volcano became active, a bulge began growing on the side of the mountain and began to grow at 5 to 8 feet per day. She's an alternative and uh, active in legislative issues and has given testimony for Senate Health Committee, disease-reversal.com. And Dr. Bark, thank you so much for coming uh, on with us. You heard me kind of set the table there for folks that just tuned in. Some of the news, um, we're, we're going to break in five minutes, but first off, thank you for coming on with us. Uh, but but, but wh what is front and center for you today with all the changes that are happening? Well, I, I do see the tide turning somewhat. Yesterday, I was an expert witness in um, a Midwestern state in family court. This is something that I've done many times. This is on regarding vaccine custody issues. I've done it in Australia as well. Um, I've worked on cases in, in Canada, and I have a case in the vaccine court itself right now as well. But I do feel that the tide is turning. I mean, the judge yesterday was fascinated with hearing what I had to say about the lack of vaccine safety, about the court, and the opposing physician um, was unaware of the vaccine court, unaware of VAERS reporting, was not aware of what how to recognize a vaccine damage. And this is exactly what we see is that while the government set up this system in 86, and it was 14 shots we were pushing at that time, 14, we are up to, by the age of five, we are up to, you know, 49 doses in some states, in some states it's 63, in some states it's more if they push an annual flu shot or the, the nasal inhalant for under six years of age. And then in some states it's even more because we're seeing Gardasil, while it's not on any state mandate other than Rhode Island, um, it is being pushed heavily at the doctor's office. So I see more bills coming down the road. We know there's something called Healthy People 2020, which is for adults and it's tied to the Department of Transportation. That's really freaking scary. That means, oh, you know, Mr. Jones, you haven't, we're, we don't know that you've been vaccinated in the last 10 years. You can't get on this flight. You need to step out of the line and go get MMR, I, OPV, IPV, DPT. That's right. God knows what else. That's you what's know, going you know, uh, as as dystopic a face I try to put on things, I get an expert like you on, Doctor Bark, and then I start realizing all the horrible stuff I forgot to say. They want this as a right to travel, uh, to to supposedly medicalize us, and this is a whole military industrial big pharma complex that's been caught in thousands of, in many cases, lethal secret testing on the general public. Why would we trust anything? that big pharmaceutical co co companies like Bayer, who for a decade knowingly had HIV and hepatitis A, B, and C in their factor eight blood product and in their own court cases, it, mainstream news, even NBC News came out and said, they said, screw it, keep selling it, who cares if we kill people? I mean, you talk about an arrogant group of evil folks. Congress allowed them. So Congress passed, you know, it was illegal for them to sell that factor eight, the HIV tainted factor eight in the states. But Congress passed something at the 11th hour, literally at the 11th hour. It was like midnight on a Christmas Eve. And Canada. yeah, and they were allowed to um, sell it to Spain, Portugal, and I believe um, France or Japan. And then That's about right. 15,000 people developed HIV from the tainted factor eight. And there were lawsuits. But, you know, it's the price of doing business. I mean, the amount they had to pay out is nothing compared to what they made. on. And let's be clear, the executive's eight. minutes have been public from the criminal trials in France and Australia and other areas. 
it came out that they knew it had HIV and hepatitis Absolutely. was a death sentence to basically anyone that took it with the HIV and they did it. Folks, these are sick people. Please continue, doctor. Yeah. So, I mean, that's one example. You know, there's many examples like the SV40 tainted polio vaccine. Cancer virus. Exactly. And that was the 40th simian virus. You know, we don't even talk about the other 39. Um, but, you know, the government knew that they were aware that SV40 was was contaminating that polio vaccine. And what they said to the to I believe it was Cutter that was first making it and then a few other companies was that, you know, we'll allow you to sell off this lot. You've got till you've got a few more years to sell this off. And then we want you to start over. Well, there's actually so first of all, that's egregious and nefarious. And then there's evidence that it was in tainting the vaccines as late as, as 1997. Wow. Well, you've done so much amazing work. When you testify to Congress or the Senate, uh, I mean, I know you try to crystallize the info down, but uh, we've got the CDC documents, as you know, from 2000, where the head of the CDC is like, I'm not going to let my grandkids have this. What are we going to do? We got to cover this up. But they never fix it. It's only gotten worse. Now there's more vaccines they want to take. I mean, as autism goes from, you know, one in 30,000 to one in 58, they're talking about one in three within a decade. There's got to be a point where they know the epidemic's going to be so bad that they're going to end up getting brought down or are they just kicking the can down the road, doctor? No, I mean, if you think about it, the healthcare system, the whole system in the United States is the largest growing business. It's the largest growing field in the whole world. I mean, exponential, you know, between CVSs on every corner, between hospitals growing um, and new medical centers and urgent cares everywhere. This is an exploding field. And so they see it as a win-win. I mean, if more people are sick, <clears throat> you know, if we can manage to not kill people, but just really damage them so they have chronic illness, then the drug companies make a lot of money, the hospitals make a lot of money. You know, these nonprofit quote unquote hospitals, they get away with so much bullshit. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, it's worse than the for profits because they get federal tax money. They they sell a can of Coke for ten dollars, only get a dollar from insurance. So then they get federal funding for the nine dollars, or you know, an aspirin for a hundred dollars, or a Pap smear for three hundred, and the insurance company only pays fourteen, and then the rest the federal government gives. So them. it's I mean, just like it's, the military industrial complex, seven hundred billion a year here alone. Of course they're funding Al Qaeda. Of course they're funding terror groups because when the terror groups then attack. They then have an excuse to go into those countries and half the time don't even target the actual group. They'll target somebody totally innocent like the Iraqi people. Well, it, you know, so this is a good example. So yesterday or the day before, yesterday I was testifying all day. So I was driving and testifying. But the day before I was posting something and I saw somebody was um, talking about how great carbs and he studies cardiovascular disease and he's saying the benefit of eating a carb diet. And I talked about ketogenic diets, you know, that I put a lot of my patients into ketosis, it reverses cancer, it reverses diabetes, it reverses heart disease, even Alzheimer's. And he immediately attacked me and said, patients can die, it's deadly dangerous. I mean, this is coming out the same day that you know the, the whole industrial complex is admitting that pharmaceuticals is the third leading cause of death. And I, by the way, think it's probably second or first leading cause of, cause of death, and we can talk about that. But you know, to say that it's dangerous, deadly dangerous to go into ketosis. This is one of the most out of control, mass killing industries ever. It's like Satan telling you if you read a Playboy, you might become Satan. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's totally insane. It's, it's, right. it's like Hitler saying, don't be mean to the Jews. In fact, get into that, doctor. Let's talk about the numbers because we find the same thing. It looks like medical neglect, medical problems, uh, it, you know, uh, uh, mistakes and drugs are probably together the number one cause of death. Well, I see it a little differently. Those are very high numbers that cause death. But actually, if you really think about it, you know, I'll see a breast cancer patient, right? And then I take the history because I spend two hours with all my patients. And the history could be that they were in rounds and rounds and rounds of antibiotics, rounds of antibiotics. So, you know, we know that when you're on a lot of antibiotics, um, it alters your bowel flora. It also reduces your intrahepatic, it increases intrahepatic circulation of hormones without degrading them and detoxifying them. So it's possible that patient would have never had breast cancer if they weren't thrown antibiotics for every friggin' sinus complaint, every friggin' cold. You know, so it's worse than that. And then look at the vaccines that can possibly be contaminated with retroviruses. We know that. 
I mean, we know that there's contamination, prions, retroviruses, um, passages, you know, they put the vaccines through passages through these varro cells and these, these longevity cell lines. And at certain passages, they're carcinogenic, they're oncogenic. So how do we know that a polio vaccine that somebody got when in the 60s when they were a child, and now they're eating glyphosate, you know, on their food, um, that the combination is not increasing their risk for cancer, you know, especially then if they've had antibiotics thrown at them. So a lot of times when you hear patients died from complications of their disease, um, I believe that they actually died from the medications. You know, another Absolutely. Good Doctor, stay right there. I've got to say, I am so impressed with you because I've done read so much literature, mainline studies. This stuff's really hidden out there, but I've never heard somebody move as fast as you and bring up so many key things. So hopefully, maybe you stay the whole hour if you can, because I want to get more into this with you and, and, and obviously have you back a lot. Uh, but uh, Dr. Uh, Tony Barks, our guest, disease-reversal.com. Back up a little bit sure. and get into the viruses, the prions, folks. That's what is connected to Alzheimer's and other things that we know are in the vaccines. You got into immortal cell lines. This is all mainline science. Well, that's it for the show tonight. Thank you all for tuning in, and we'll see you here again Monday at 7 p.m. Central.